do not reduce the size of the unbound God Almighty to the pain of your life. Don't reduce him to that size. He wants to bless you. Don't prevent the blessing. Hello, everybody, and welcome to podcast number 128 of the Gordon and Sharice Show. And it's so good to be back with you, Gordon. And thank you, audience, for being here with us. We are excited to continue in this topic that is so relevant to your life. It is something that that I'm just really, really excited and passionate about because it deals with the creative mind, the imagination. We're talking about your imagination and healing, and this is part two of the topic. And honey, there's just so much to say. I, I don't even know if we got halfway through we didn't. And I love all these topics because they can be stretched for long distances of conversation and thinking and contemplation and discussion and debate. And they're wonderful because they all apply to our faith. They apply to healing and they apply as is basically one of the antidotes for dealing with pain. Mm. And, and you, that's what we're doing. 100%. I, I think from our discussion last week, what was so interesting to hear from you, and it, it's still on my mind, is the invisible. And that pain, you can't really see it. It's invisible. And I've been thinking about that and also correlating that with the imagination, which is invisible, but it's always working. And so it's funny because... So many times we get caught in this vicious loop of trying to fight pain with everything that we can see instead of also working on those invisible things that are that are at play in our life. And our mind is something that really and truly, I believe, is a gift from God. And we can use it to for the good of our life and our body, or we can use it to destroy ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you have uh, a lot more to say about it. So, well, I I wanted to talk about prayer today, okay, related to imagination and healing. Hmm. Okay, because with prayer, we're dealing with a finite human being. Okay, regardless of gender, who is going to communicate with a seemingly invisible God. And we know this, that it's almost when your brain is so full of connections that are dealing with your past Mm -hmm. and stresses and anxiety and hormones are off and neurotransmitters aren't moving like they should and there's imbalances everywhere in your body, we know this. When you're trying to go into prayer, A lot of people will move into prayer and they have a new thought or they have a stressful thought in their mind before they can even have one minute of prayer with God. Mm -hmm. And what happens to them at that moment? And and then they start thinking of the thoughts and they Mm -hmm. move off of God and then they use vain imagination or fake imagination Mm -hmm. in in this case to say, let me move back to God, and then I'll do the ABCs. I'll praise God. I'll say the Father's Prayer. I'll do what I need to do to have the checklist, but nothing's happening differently with my life. That's true. And I still live in pain, and it feels like my prayers are going on to deaf ears of a God who doesn't listen to me anymore. But it's so in that situation, the imagination is being used against yourself. Absolutely. And I talked about this last week, but I want to go back over it about the definition of vain according to Webster's. So a vain imagination having no real value or significance, worthless, empty, idle, hollow, without force or effect, futile, fruitless, unprofitable, unavailing. That's Those are thoughts. If we have vain imaginations... That is something that's absolutely lifeless. There's nothing life-giving in having a vain imagination. 
It's right. meant for destruction. Right. Mm-hmm. And you, you don't move into prayer with the right attitude. Mm-hmm. There's, okay. there's always going to be distractions to prayer. I think prayer in, in itself, it's, it's something that takes time to develop that communication and that relationship with God. And it's not about beating yourself up to have perfect prayers, but it's about opening your space inside of you and not letting that vain imagination steal the communion with God. Right. Do you know why I like sports so much? Oh, I, there's because your grandson does? Well, probably. <laughs> but let's just take two things. Golf, which we have the Masters and that, that was just played. And let's take pickleball. You and I are doing pickleball right now together. You are um, absolutely. I think you're going to go on the senior tour for now, pickleball. I'm going to make some comparisons so people <laughs> understand this about prayer life. I'm going to try to make this as practical as I can yeah. to explain the fact that when you start pickleball, you don't know any strategy. You don't know the rules. You don't know the scoring. You hit the ball a few times and you feel good about yourself, but it's hit or miss. You might have slammed one and think you're a good pickleball player. You might have slammed your partner in the face. You you may have done that. <laughs> but the point is, is that you're basically a novice. And then the more you play pickleball, which you have, and I've seen a progression in your skill level because you've never really played racket sports in your life. You have really come and progressed, but here's what you're doing. What is my technique? I need to get on the court two to three times a week if possible. Mm -hmm. What's my strategy? How am I effective with my, my partner? How do I communicate differently? What's the vision that I see? Where do I place the ball? So You have to be in the moment. You have to be in the moment. So Mm -hmm. here's the beauty. The same thing applies to prayer life. It does. Okay, the first time you might hit a home run with a miracle prayer or an emergency prayer because you have an emergency need or a petition and something gets answered. Mm -hmm. But the point is to have a sustained prayer life. A lot of it comes from your thinking first. All of it, actually. Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay, but I'm talking about when I say most of it, I'm talking about the fact that you're focused on a monologue at first. You haven't even established a dialogue with God. Right. You've only got a monologue. So those are your thoughts. To move into a dialogue is to release your thoughts, to tap into a subconscious and be still with your mind, to trust God with all the parts of your life, mm. to praise him and not just praise him because you have to, But you start acknowledging and you sense this momentum of energy and inspiration because you do see who he is, and then you learn to see and discover who you are. That's where prayer comes in because then probably the most difficult thing that I see with pain Mm -hmm. is that we still have our will that we're imposing to try to get rid of pain. On our terms. On our terms. I'm going to muscle it up. I'm not relinquishing my will whatsoever, because if I do, pain's going to take me down even further. Mm. So one of the hardest things to do is to be disciplined in this dialogue with God. I don't care if it starts with your thoughts, volleying them back and forth with the Lord, Okay. You're really pickleballing it. Yeah. But (laughs) I I, I really want to share this because it's true. Yeah. Okay. Then when you become disciplined, then you understand strategies. Then you see how truth works. You see how truth then brings brings actually unity to a bunch of different viewpoints Mm -hmm. instead of just separates them and sends some people here and some people there. Okay. You see the love of God come through. You see, you sense how you're being nurtured on the invisible. But it's all part of that whole perspective. So for me, it's not that your imagination creates a God that doesn't exist. Your imagination that grows is is saying, I, I can't 
fathom some of, some of the greatness and comprehension of who God is. I, I, I'm not there. I need my imagination to grow in a sense to take the truth and to think beyond myself. Mm-hmm. And God's there. But you start having a relationship with God and it becomes back and forth, back and forth. Totally. And God is, what he's doing is he's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to save you and give you life-giving mm-hmm. sustenance by faith. Totally. Okay. I think the the very fact that we are given an imagination is so that we can connect to God. It's so that we can actually place our mind on these things that are so life-giving because life comes from God. And it can be so misused when we don't make that connection and we just infuse it into the things that destroy us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, I think what you're saying is so important and especially related to prayer, Gordon. Well, with prayer, many of us are moving our lives in prayer are primarily comprised of pain-filled requests or pleas of desperation of Mm -hmm. save me or deliver me, or I need this particular thing to enhance my life. Mm -hmm. And I've written a few questions down or a few points down about prayer, thinking of them, these questions and thoughts in the context of suffering. Good. Share them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number one, here's what daily prayer means to me. It's that we develop a constant bent and drift of our souls to God. Hmm. Okay. So if we're stationed here and we're saying, okay, Heavenly Father, I'm going to stand firm. And all of these vain imaginations are going to take captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay, that's my my spiritual warfare. And I'm going to stand firm right here. Pain is going to try to pull you over. Mm-hmm. And once you see that pain doesn't have to have that much control, mm-hmm. and you can be one step ahead of pain, you're going to see that you're bent and then your drift of who you are in, in the three-part person, body, soul, and spirit, moves towards God. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to see that's how nourishment occurs. Okay? And as you're being bent, think about the fact that you're growing in spiritual musculature. Hmm. You're growing on the inside in order to have the endurance to move forward, and to seek the deeper things of God Mm -hmm. by faith. So good. It's not that you make your faith stronger. It's that you say, hey, flesh set aside, I'm a spiritual being first, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to be nourished by God. Okay? To me, Mm -hmm. that's that's one of the things with daily prayer and how we develop this bent and drift towards Him. Because that... I mean, I love it because the image is so much better, even in my mind as you're saying it. The visual is there. I'm using my imagination to think about what that looks like versus, you know, thinking about the drift just going towards pain. Yes. I mean, it's it's our choice every day, life or death. Well, imagination also brings colors to our stories. <laughs> And you are colorful. Yeah, well, I am today. Actually, I I like the purple. Okay. Let's go to point number two. I want you to think of this with your life, even though it may contain pain with your prayer requests and everything else. Mm -hmm. In a sense, our life is a continual state of prayer. Because prayer is not just words being expressed to God. Mm -hmm. It's actions being lived out. Mm -hmm. And we are continually in a state of prayer when our thoughts keep moving in a bent and drift towards him. So one might ask, Gordon, how many times do you pray a day? Well, I used to pray out loud a lot longer. When we first got married, we prayed five to six hours a day together. That's why we got married so quickly, because we couldn't handle that many hours of praying. (laughs) Okay. 
but I used I used to have more public prayers, and and I'm all for public prayers, but I'm finding for me at this season, a lot of excess public prayers for me are not as effective as the hundred different prayers I have during the day. The inward prayers. The inward prayers with yeah. my mind towards God and even just asking questions. You know, I was I, I, I was at the dentist earlier this morning and as I was I was I was driving and I saw Pike's Peak and I saw the the snow over Pike's Peak and I, you could tell the wind was blowing. I was like, Heavenly Father, how did you create this? Hmm. How did you know that I would be watching it, watching the mountains and the beauty at this exact second? Hmm. You're amazing. So that's a form of prayer, adoration. And so what happens is your thoughts help grow you in a sense mm. to be in a continual state of prayer. And it brought you, as you mentioned, the drift. It brought you out of your pain because you were going to the dentist for acute pain right now. It's something else. We won't go into all of it. But I mean, so that... Hold on, Sharice. There's a lot of spiritual warfare with our platform. I guess by the there way. is. Anyone listening right now, can I just ask that you become automatic prayer warriors for us. Because Gordon would like to keep a few of his teeth. I would like to keep my teeth, my kidneys, <laughs> my, my liver. My no, goodness. As you talk about this, the drift was off of your tooth and onto the beauty, onto something far greater. Right. Onto the majesty of God. Onto God's imagination. Uh, exactly. So you connected to that and it pulled you immediately through another doorway in your mind. Yes, it did. Um, so you, it gave you the strength to come into this room this morning when most people would be in bed with a tooth infection and a split tooth and all of this. And instead, you have the strength to do this today. Yes, I do. Um, because you chose with your imagination to drift with God. Right. But I also had experience like the pickleball analogy. Mm -hmm. And I've trained enough in my prayer life where I've rehearsed who I was going to be even with my eyes opened. Yes. A lot of times my prayers have always started with my eyes closed out of pure <laughs> respect for God and reverence. Holy fear for God, just reverence and the, the holiness and purity that he has, closing my eyes. But even as I open my eyes and in my thoughts, okay, I've rehearsed my times with the Lord enough mm. to know that I have a constant state of prayer. And then that changes the steps that we take in life. Well, it changes, it literally changes, your body follows those prayers, Yes. Instead of the body leading the pain, it's it's not that you are harsh to your body. It's not that you hate your body. It's that you love your body enough to not let it lead. Right. You and, you don't let it become the authority over the pain. Right. Well, the bo the body does this. It starts to respond to the emotions. But here's what really happens. Here's how the body is is almost tricked into moving into faith. Okay. Tricked into healing. You want a brand new trap? Instead of being ensnared and being harmed in a, a trap like a bird is in a in an iron cage or or whatever or an animal is. How about the trap of the fact that you're in the arms of God? Well that's actually okay. not a trap. <laughs> uh, but 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 I'm saying this you're moving in a direction. Yeah. Okay. In which you start developing an increased vision about life mm -hmm. when you're in a continual state of prayer. And then you find yourself in a place that you never thought you would be. You find yourself in new circumstances. You find that coincidences are not coincidences. They're not accidents. That's right. You find that there are some things happening in your life mm. and with people around you in which you're connected that all relate to one big story, and it's his. And that the, the right people will begin to rally around you. You know, that's so important for people to believe that... Um, there can be a new community that comes into your life, but 
searching for those people first, searching for, you know, alleviation of all pain first, all of those things are not going to make life better. It's not going to happen that way. But that drift towards God, as you said, all these other things start happening. Right. Then then you get the support. For, I mean, it's happening in my own life right now with some of the traumatic experiences that I've gone through in my life, even childhood. It's like first being aware, then I'm I'm capturing my imagination about stuff, communing with God. I'm drifting towards God instead of all the trauma. Mm-hmm. But God is giving me a new set of people and and talk about neuroplasticity. I'm I'm working with people who are that is their life and their skill set. Right. And so it's amazing what happens when you let go and you get into that space. Amen. What I love too, Gordon, when you're talking about prayer and it becoming the way that you're describing it. It's it's a beautiful conversation that's continual. Yes. It's it's like you and I are married. We don't just stop talking to each other for three quarters of the day. We don't ignore each other. There's a there's a communion between us. Right. I think that's one of our greatest strengths in our marriage is is communication. Right. And I think that's how it is with the Lord. Mm-hmm. We don't it's not like I have to come to you with some formalized, oh, Lord Gordon. You would actually probably like that, but I'm not doing it today. Okay. But, you know, if I don't come to you with this formal conversation, I'm coming to you as your wife. And we get to come to God as we are. It's not formalized in some, in some like way that is fake and adds phoniness. So the imagination will bring you closer to the truth of God if you let it. Absolutely. Let's go to the third point. And we're only on point three. Yes, we are. (laughs) Our ruling passion usually regulates how we pray. Hmm. I want you to think about that. So I know with our lives, our passion isn't about fighting some pain monster every day. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. That pain monster is already slain for us by Christ. And in understanding that we have a passion about our purpose and significance for living, Mm -hmm. the why is answered. And when that why gets answered for yourself and you see the significance in even remaining alive and moving from survival to thriving, Mm -hmm. when you get to that point, that's going to dictate how you pray, what you pray for, what you believe. So pain tries to keep you in disbelief. Right. Prayer and our ruling passion in God moves us into belief. Hmm. That's a big difference. And does belief lead to... Gordon, from your experience, to healing. Yes. You can say that with full conviction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I we mentioned we just we I, I think we're joking around for the audience. It's really no joke. But I, I we have dealt with some recent both of us some recent physical attacks from the enemy. Yeah, okay. unlike anything we've gone through before. Uh, we we notice this is a season and all at the same time and all at the same time. But mm-hmm. but here's the things, folks. Here's what I know. Okay. I know that through the process. It does not cause me to walk into disbelief Mm -hmm. or discouragement or self-pity. We're already trained in our prayer life and study of the word and the way that we communicate with each other, okay? What happens is it translates into our belief and we realize healing's a choice and healing is a journey. Mm-hmm. And we're on the journey. Yep, we are. And sometimes the journey is full of thorns and yeah. thistles and enemies and thieves and killers and and unreal and unwelcome trials in our lives. 
We all get it. Hmm. Our whole nation is under it, folks. Everyone has got a story that will is 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 heart wrenching. Yeah. Okay. And so we get it, but that's not going to stop us from believing. No. Okay. And as you mentioned the word enemy, you know, we can be our worst enemy. Or pain can be what's perceived as the worst enemy. Right. Um, but the interesting thing, I, I read this this morning um, on an Instagram called The Daily Prophetic, and I just, I love this, this, uh, this Instagram post that was talking about that your enemy is actually the doorway to your future. Hmm. Totally, totally agree. And so it's like Goliath was the doorway to David's future as a king. Well, that's part of the next point, Sharice. Okay. <laughs> Did I take away point okay. are we on well, point four? We're on point number four. <laughs> so let's 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 piggyback off of that. Okay. Point number four is this. In prayer, okay, whatever your desires, passions, petitions, imagination, discovering of, of God. Whatever you're asking him, what doors you're knocking on, those type of things, Mm -hmm. I want to say this. When you pray, when you're praying to God, your prayers are being elevated and purified. Hmm. Your desires Hmm. change. And, And I want to share this, and we've had this happen. Well, here's my imagination, or here's my dream. I want this to occur for my life. Well, change happens many times when our initial dreams are seemingly smashed into bits and pieces. Yeah. Because God's got something better, even though we can't see it. And we say, no, no, Heavenly Father, I've walked this far in the journey. I've got spiritual maturity. I've got the handle on sharing in the sufferings of Christ. I understand healing. I have power in my prayer life. Mm. No, no, no. This dream is supposed to come true. And by golly, I'm going to stick with my prayer life until that dream comes true based upon what I want. And a lot of times... We've seen it even in our own lives, and we can chuckle on it. We're walking through it right now. We are walking through it right Mm -hmm. now, okay? And we are going through that right now. And what the Lord says is this. I've taken your dreams, and I've raised them up to the heavenlies. Yeah. And guess what? Your thoughts are being purified. Everything is being purified according to eternal life. 100%. One hundred percent, and and you have no clue the mansion that's being built for you. The shattered and broken dreams are reconstructed by Him, right? And don't be afraid to allow your imagination to drift towards Him, right? When you feel so broken, right, right, right. Let's go over. A valuable takeaway from today. Okay. What do you got? <laughs> well, this is, it's not from what we have said, but this is something on my heart and I must say it. Um, I was studying this morning um, in the Passion Translation, Psalm 7841. Let's hear it. And I want to just preface it by saying, do not limit God by your small mind. Like, Again and again, they limited God, preventing him from blessing them. Continually, they turned back from him and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Mm. So you know what's beautiful and, and sad about this verse all at the same time? It was the people. It was the Israelites. It's you and I when we're not using our imagination correctly, limiting God, putting God into our pocket jury, like putting God on trial and and limiting him. And the truth is, and the character of God comes out in this verse, preventing him from blessing them. What did God want to do? Bless him. He wanted to bless. God wants to bless you, listener. He wants to bless you. He wants to keep you. He wants to hold you. He wants to guide you. He wants to renew your mind. And what I I just love it because 
do you, do we limit God? We do. If we limit him to the size of our imagination and we don't give our imagination to God and we don't take away those vain imaginations, um, God wants to bless you and give him the full authority in your life. Give him power, majesty, fullness. Do not reduce the size of the unbound God Almighty to the pain of your life. Don't reduce him to that size. Right. He wants to bless you. Don't prevent the blessing. Hmm. Very good. I've got two thoughts for my valuable takeaway, and we'll conclude for today. Okay. Thought number one, I wrote this down. Prayer is the training ground for transformation of your character. Okay, for me, for instance, as an example, it was having the ability to endure painful trials through a prayerful faith in Christ, mm -hmm. which enabled me to synthesize pain and suffering into miraculous inner transformation. Mm -hmm. But it was done by God's power. That's number one. Number two, take captive your thoughts, and I'm just going to read the scripture. Yes. Okay. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Mm. You don't have to allow all the speculations, all the doubt, all the toxicity, all the poison arrows that are being flung into mm -hmm. your heart mm -hmm. and sent into your mind to poison you and to pull you away from who God is. It's time to elevate. It's time to elevate. So good. So get a hold of us, folks. We'll be back next Wednesday. But get a hold of us on gordonandsharice.com, and you can see all the ways you can buy courses and mm -hmm. social media and, 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 and basically look through our whole website, and you're going to get everything that you need and become part of our community. We have memberships now available. Become part of the healing journey. And we are the pain transformers. So, be reformers. Oh, <laughs> I said transformers. You're didn't thinking I? of JJ, your grandson. I'm thinking of my grandson. <laughs> but yes, we are pain reformers. Yes, and, we are. And let's be a part of that together as a community. Yes. Let's do it, guys. Let's we'll, get involved. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank Therese. you. See you next time.